we will not waste any time uh, we will start uh, this webinar lecture series episode 4 i welcome you all uh, to the fourth episode of our lecture series hello sir good evening sir uh, so i think all the speakers are here uh, i can see yes sir uh, Professor Kumar Swami, uh, ICSSR Senior Fellow, Department of Geography, Bharti Dasan University, Trichy. Uh, Dr. Shishir Kumar Dash, Scientist E, National Center for Coastal Research, uh, Ministry of Earth Science, Government of India, Chennai. And Mr. R. Nagarajan, Scientist and Head, GIS and Remote Sensing Wing, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, Chen uh, Chennai. So I welcome you all uh, for this wonderful uh, get together of geographers and other special uh, special science interested people uh, and students, research scholars. Uh, my hearty welcome. Uh, so now I would like to request uh, Sister Helen, Assistant Professor, Department of Geography for the official welcome and introduction of speakers. Sister, are you there? I request all the participants to mute their mic and their video. Kindly cooperate with us. Helen, sister. Sister Helen Jennifer, are you there? Sorry for the inconvenience. I think Helen's sister is uh, having some technical difficulties. She will be joining with us in a minute. Participants, kindly wait. Uh, she's joining us. Some technical issue with her uh, connection.
I invite uh, Sister Helen uh, for giving the official welcome and introduction of speakers. Shall I give you, ma'am? Yes, yes, you can go ahead. It's okay, ma'am. Okay. Good afternoon to all. It gives me immense pleasure in welcoming all of you on behalf of the Department of Geography, Nirmala College for Women, to the webinar lecture series, episode four, on the theme Real Time Development Applications of Remote Sensing and GIS Program. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kumar Swami K., ICSSR Senior Fellow, Department of Geography, Bharidasan University, Tirchrapalli. He graduated his BA in Geography from Government Arts College, Koyamuthur, and Masters from Madras University. To his credit, he is a first rank holder in UG and BG degrees. He completed his BA in Madurai Kamaraj University, holds a doctorate from University of Madras on the topic Water Resources Management. He has completed a certificate course in remote sensing and passed with distinction okay. at Dehradun. He also completed his international PhD diploma in hydrology with excellent grade in Budapest, Hungary. His teaching experience has more than 27 years as a professor, reader, and lecturer, and senior lecturer in the Department of Geography, Bharidasan University, Tirchrapalli. His research experience has more than 37 years. His various responsibilities are syndicate, senate member, chair, school of geosciences, professor and head, director of the council for college and curriculum development, coordinator for UGC, SAP, DRS 1 and 2, convener in flying squad and nodal officer in Bharadasan University, Tirchrapalli. He is prominently known for his specialization in Geoinformatics, Water Resource Management, and Disaster Studies. Under him, 20 scholars completed their PhD, 8 are ongoing, 18 scholars completed their MPhil. He published his articles in 13 journals and two conferences in international level, and one journal and two conferences in national level. We are glad to have such an eminent personality amidst us today. Welcome you, sir. I feel honored to welcome Dr. Sisir Kumar Das, Scientist E, National Center for Coastal Research Ministry of Air Sciences, Government of India, Chennai. He graduated his Master's and Master of Philosophy in Oceanography, Bharapur, Unifer Bharapur University, Odisha. He completed his postgraduate diploma in Computer Science and he holds a PhD in Image and Information Sciences. His employment records are ranges from project scientists junior and senior research fellow, researcher, assistant professor, project manager, scientist C, D, and E. His major programs and achievements are such as ecosystem modeling for Chilika Lagoon, Southwest Coast of India, Coastal Vulnerability Study for Tamil Nadu Coast, and Chennai Flood Warning System. He was awarded with his Certificate of Merit for his outstanding contribution in the field of ocean science in the year 2015. His publications include more than 20 in national and international referred journals. He also published more than 15 publications in national and international proceedings. He delivered more than 10 talks in national and international workshops. I welcome you, sir. Next, I would like to welcome our eminent speaker, N. R. Nagarajan, Head of GIS and Remote Sensing, M. S. Swaminathan Research Foundation, Chennai, India. Yeah, R. Nagarajan is the scientist and head of the GIS and remote sensing lab at MSSRF, and he holds a master's degree in spatial information technology and pursuing his thesis on quantifying the above ground biomass of mangroves using machine learning technique with an integration of optical and SAR satellite images. He has 15 years of expertise in GIS and remote sensing applications in water resource, urban rural planning, land use and land cover, and coastal zone management, and socio-economic mapping. Prior to his assignment in MSSRF, he gained practical knowledge in GIS and remote sensing experience by working with international and national teams, especially in the programs of the World Bank, GIZ, United Nations Development Program, Google Link, and Government of Tamil Nadu, and in the Aravalli Foundation. He is expertise in satellite imagery interpretation, cartography, WebGIS, 
spatial modeling and various advanced software such as RGS, RGS server, AirDOS, eCognition and other open source softwares. He is also the course coordinator for ISRO IARS outreach program at MSSRF. He has completed specialized short courses on satellite agrometeorology, uh, hyperspectral remote sensing, and UAV remote sensing from the Indian Space Research Organization. He also acquired hands-on training at Google Inc., San Francisco, USA for Google Earth's engine, and advanced spatial analytics and deep learning from IAIT Bangalore and NIAS IASC Bangalore. Welcome, sir. Again, I would like to welcome all the dearest participants who have constantly extend their love and constant support. Once again, I welcome you all for their webinar. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Uh, so now I welcome uh, Dr. Kumar Sami, ICSSR Senior Fellow, uh, Department of Geography, Bharti Dasan University, uh, for his lecture on applications of geoinformatics. Uh, I now hand over the session to you, sir. Okay. Is it audible? Yes, sir. It's audible. Okay. Uh, visibility also is good? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Now, um, you can share the screen, sir. Uh, I'll allow okay. you. You can start sharing. Kumar, sir, we're there. Oh, Nala, we're there. Okay. 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 All the best. Okay. Okay. So, respected uh, principal of the prestigious uh, Narmada College of Women of Coimbatore. Uh, My dear uh, fellow speakers of this uh, web series uh, seminar being organized by the college, then faculty members, including the head of the department of uh, this uh, college, and above all, uh, the participants and friends from various uh, parts of India and locally. I'm happy to be with you this evening, talking about uh, a few aspects of uh, uh, geoinformatics, the basics of geoinformatics, and then uh, its application. Probably most of us are aware of uh, this uh, new technology, or rather uh, about 40 years uh, old technology. Um, uh, this uh, lecture uh, pertains only to the application. And uh, uh, after the lecture, if you have any clarifications, you may call me by email. You may say as much as you have to I am now the Emeritus Professor and an ICSR Senior Fellow. And before that, I was uh, UGC PSR Faculty Fellow. Well, uh, if you look at uh, the Earth as a science, at science, we have four spheres. Uh, if all those four spheres are studied, then you become the master of uh, geoscience for a lifetime. The four spheres include uh, the lithosphere, uh, hydrosphere, atmosphere, and then the biosphere. So, lithosphere uh, concerns with the rock, uh, mostly the geologists are concerned with uh, the lithospheric study, that is the geology. So their concern is uh, studying the materials, you know, beneath the surface of the earth, that is uh, rocks, minerals, soil, and so on. The second uh, group of uh, scientists, of uh, earth scientists, include uh, the oceanographers, study the uh, hydrosphere of uh, various forms, that is the uh, solid form, liquid form, and then the gaseous form. The third group of scientists of uh, geosciences include the geologists of uh, Studying the atmospheric elements like gases, gas, clouds, water, precipitations, and so on. And the fourth group is the biospheric uh, science, that's the life science of uh, studying plants, animals, and so on. So sorry to interrupt, your voice yes, is yes. feeble. Sir, your oh, voice has become so feeble, sir. Now, is it all right? Or... Uh, very feeble, sir. Oh, is it for all or? Uh, for all participants are at the link. Oh, I see. No problem. Now, is it all right? Or... 
Do you have any problem now? Sir, I am able to hear, but it's very feeble, sir. Oh, I see. Uh, you have to adjust your mic, Kumar, sir. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, just opposite to my mouth. You could see it. Okay. Huh? I talk loudly. Okay, and sir. Then, okay, um, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, where is the position of geography? Geography is to study all the spheres, the fundamentals of all spheres, and consider uh, Earth. It means uh, you have to study the intra and interrelationships of various spheres. That is the uh, uh, that is a core of uh, earth sciences uh, in general geography. And then it also concerns with uh, the study of uh, primary, secondary, and then tertiary activities of man. This is the second aspect. So your geographers would uh, know the fundamentals of all spheres, the intra and interrelationships. Secondly, they should be understanding the primary, secondary, and tertiary activities of man. And the third one is uh, the maps. That is, he should be a good cartographer, he should be a map analyst, and then he should know about the latest methods like remote sensing, and And if uh, all the three are uh, concerned, and if he is expert in this, then it will be a best, better job. Then, coming to the, the topic of our discussion, geoinformatics. Like uh, bioinformatics, geoinformatics is concerned with, as uh, everyone knows, is the app information. Earlier, uh, some uh, 50, 60 years before it was uh, geometry, like uh, econometrics, likewise, uh, it is a geometrics, geometry rather, and uh, before that, it was um, the navigators, and then uh, they were sailing, and then they were ma making the maps, and that was the concern. Now, uh, some 30, 40 years before, uh, it came as a geomatics, and now it is turned to geoinformatics, because uh, geoinformatics is a word mostly accepted universally by the scientists. So probably the definition says that uh, it's a science and technology of using the geographic information, geospatial information, and the infrastructure, hardware software, to assess the resources and also to address the problems of the society. This is uh, one among the hundreds of definitions of geoinformatics. And what is the concerns of, or branches of uh, geoinformatics? There are three major elements in uh, geoinformatics. One is uh, remote sensing, second is uh, GNSS, and the third is, uh, changes. And uh, remote sensing, as the name uh, promotes, uh, it is uh, concerned with uh, maybe the definition uh, uh, runs like this. Uh, it is an integrated discipline of uh, encompassing uh, some branches of arts, some branches of science, and also the technology of collecting the information about the terrestrial objects using a camera system or a sensor system or any other uh, latest techniques, and process the data visually or uh, digitally, uh, make the thematic maps to address the problems of the society. Probably the uh, problems will be as many as we imagine. If you use uh, aerial uh, system as a platform, then uh, that is called aerial remote sensing. Maybe the aerial uh, camera or drones also, that is the aerial remote sensing. And if you use satellites in various altitudes, whether it is uh, uh, geostationary or certain synchronous or spy satellite or whatever, maybe in different altitudes, then uh, these uh, are called the satellite remote sensing. Uh, if you use uh, temperature as a base to collect the information, then uh, that branch is called the thermal remote sensing. And if you use radar, radio detection and ranging as a base, then uh, that branch is called the radar remote sensing. And finally, we are ending up with a GPR, ground penetrating radar, as a component in remote sensing. So all these things, all these uh, small circles are the courses in the remote sensing course we conducted some 40 years before. Uh, we started a MTech program for geoscientists in Varadas University. And at that time, it was uh, remote sensing, MTech remote sensing. And we had uh, 
two, three courses on aerial, uh, two, three courses on satellite, uh, thermal, radar, and so on, not the GPR. And uh, two or uh, two or uh, three laboratories for each courses, and then the degree was effective uh, more sensing, and the one or two papers on GAS and then the GNSS. That was uh, at that time it was not GNSS, it was only the GPR. Uh, then the second element in geoinformatics is the global navigation satellite system and uh, probably you can also say this as a GPS. Now it is a universal name for all the navigation satellite systems and uh, it started uh, its journey like a uh, survey. So when the old uh, emperors or kings, they used to make the maps or uh, maybe uh, sculptures or paintings in the uh, temples and uh, the palaces. And that was the method of uh, describing their uh, territories. Then, uh, when the Britishers came to India, they started uh, surveying the entire uh, subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, and then they produced several thousand maps very accurately. And uh, the first point started uh, at uh, Chennai, and that was St. Thomas Mount, and the second was at Taas Antom, and so on. So, they went up to, say, from Sri Lanka to Tibet. And the best is uh, Afghanistan to Thailand and so on. So the entire uh, South Asia was uh, surveyed by the Britishers. And uh, several of those maps are used. And what we are doing now is it is only defining these maps. That's what uh, Survey of India is doing. Then uh, we have the satellite uh, surveying using the GMSS or uh, GPS methodology and then refining these maps. And now it is a mobile surveillance, uh, not only the static, but dynamic. And this uh, constitute a constant, uh, component of geoinformatics. And the third one is uh, GIS. Uh, GIS is, uh, is uh, nothing but the extension of or a bronze version of cartography. Cartography is the map making. Uh, it uh, started with uh, drawing maps by draftsmen. And then uh, it uh, needed the uh, higher uh, end of, uh, say, the geographic knowledge. And therefore, uh, it came to geography, geometry, geography, and so on. And uh, now, because of um, so many satellites, about 2,000 satellites are in orbit now. And these uh, 2,000 satellites are uh, pouring the information, and it is up to us to make use of this information. And then we are using it. And uh, so the third component in this is the computer. <clears throat> so you need a high-end computer for processing this digital data because uh, digital data is enormous. Besides that, uh, you need to uh, incorporate other uh, details also. So you need a high-end computer. And because of uh, inclusion of the internet, then the, the GAS is uh, uh, advancing like anything. So all the three components are the base of uh, GAS. Okay, so let us uh, look at uh, the basic principles and then their applications in one or two. And uh, probably the, my colleagues, the other uh, lecturers, will be talking about the remote sensing and then uh, the GNSS in a detailed manner. So any scientist or any teacher or researcher who wants to start their career, first and foremost thing they should know, they should uh, understand is the radiation principle that is the electromagnetic radius so emr has so many regions and the most they in the remote sensing uh, we are using uh, the visible spectrum 0.4 to 0.7 micrometer in the visible spectrum and uh, uh, you may recollect the memory of uh, the ERTS one or landsat one when it was launched they started uh, the band like four five six and seven it was not one two three four uh, it was four, five, six, and seven. Uh, they thought that they could include the ultraviolet region for the remote sensing activity at a later period. But unfortunately, ultraviolet could not be used uh, because of uh, attenuation problem. So they left the uh, bands uh, four, five, six, seven, and then made uh, in the Landsat two years, one, two, three, four. And uh, we are using widely the reflected uh, the thermal IR and the microwave radio waves for our uh, remote sensing system. Then uh, this is the spectral uh, reflectance curve for a different object. Anyone who wants to specialize in remote sensing should uh, uh, study in detail the spectral uh, curves. 
it, it means that each and every object on the Earth's surface has a unique character of reflecting in different spectral uh, spectral uh, uh, regions. Say, for example, we have different wavelengths and the percentage of reflectance varies. So, if you connect uh, the, uh, if you do the survey, spectral radiometric survey, and you pl plot all the points, and then if you connect then you will get a curve and that curve is the spectral curve for that particular object. Say for example, a black cotton soil or a green color indicates the vegetation. And in vegetation, you have several thousand uh, vegetation curves uh, for uh, different uh, uh, vegetation types and so on. So this is a spectral curve and this is the base for uh, studying. And if you are expert in this spectral curve, then you will be certainly an expert in visible and digital analysis. Then this is a, a digital globe image uh, with uh, 0.5 meter resolution or 50 centimeter resolution. This is a true color composite. Basically. That means uh, the vegetation appears green and all the uh, other objects appear as such they are appearing. Whereas the second one, this is an infrared image, this is called a false color composite. Uh, true color is uh, shoot out, and then uh, we, are, we are giving another uh, color. Maybe mostly we give a red color for vegetation because they are reflecting more of infrared, and therefore you can see the redness in the vegetation and also the natural uh, grass, which are reflected in the red. And uh, this is a remote sensing application, a few applications of remote sensing. Probably this is a South Indian image. And you can see on the Western side is Kerala, and you can see the redness indicating the thickness of the vegetation. Whereas uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, probably the Coimbatore, Coimbatore is here, and you can see the dryness of uh, uh, Kungu upland and even uh, Southern Tamil Nadu, excepting a few areas near uh, Dharmapuri. And then uh, not, uh, nearby Chennai, you can see the vegetation at the time. And you can also see the vegetation in the, uh, the Sri Lanka. Um, and you can also see the cloud and the deep uh, water, the ocean, and then the coastal sediments in the Gulf of Myanmar, and then uh, and so on. Okay, a few applications of uh, remote sensing, including uh, the vegetation. As we said earlier, you, you, it is possible to identify the species of area varieties. And this is a typical false color composite. And this is a forest fire that's going on. So now to monitor the forest fire, you need not go to the field as such, but you can monitor from the laboratory provided you have the connection of the satellite data. Uh, besides species identification, you can also examine the influence of or uh, the effects of pests and diseases on them and also forest fire. Uh, this is uh, one among the hundreds of applications in forest. And in geology and minerals, probably uh, Professor uh, Sridhar may be knowing about all the applications. And uh, you can identify various rocks because of the spectral nature of various rock. And also the mineral composition based classification system of elements, then oil and natural gas jewels, then volcanism based on temperature. So thermal uh, remote sensing plays a role here. Likewise, in uh, town planning also, you can identify the built-up areas, then land use mapping, then, then population estimation from aerial photographs, and so on. Here, this is the image of uh, Chennai, and you can appreciate uh, the dense uh, uh, settlement in uh, Triplicane area, then North Madras uh, area. Then you can see only the IIT and then uh, Rajbhavan area with the uh, limited uh, uh, vegetation, which are the forest. And uh, this gray, you should be very clear in distinguishing this uh, Marina Beach sand with uh, the built up area. Because this gray color gives a false indication that uh, this could be a building. No, it is not a building because. If the sand is admixed with a little bit of moisture, then it looks like a bit of data. So you need uh, uh, the visual analysis and uh, digital interpretation technique. Then uh, another interesting uh, field of application is oceanography and uh, coastal studies. 
So here uh, you can identify the cost of currents because uh, we have the other uh, lecturers who will be talking about in detail about this. So cold current, warm current, uh, then um, uh, all these things could be identified based on temperature. Then uh, plankton uh, identification, it means where you have higher plankton uh, concentration, then uh, that is used for fishpool fish pool forecasting. Then uh, coral reef analysis. Then uh, sediment analysis, as uh, I said earlier, like uh, this, uh, the sediment movement uh, it could be detected. Likewise, oil spill. If you have a uh, oil tankers colliding in a mid ocean, or uh, if you have a war like situation, then oil spill could be detected, and then this could be monitored, apply a model, and then find out where exactly the oil will be deposited, and then how to remove the oil and so on. So, this was. Uh, so many other, uh, or a few among other applications. Then in uh, meteorology, you have uh, atmospheric and then weather forecasting, or uh, you can call this as the now casting, not the forecasting. It's based on the cloud movement. You can uh, study the clouds. You can see the eye of the cyclone. And uh, uh, besides this, you have uh, ocean uh, current movement, I explained earlier. And you have the sea surface uh, temperature variation, this um, temperature variation. Then uh, the second uh, group is uh, the GNSS and then GPS. Whether uh, the word uh, GPS can be used uh, even now, because uh, on uh, several uh, board of studies meeting, I used to go for various universities, colleges, even in uh, other uh, bodies. I used to say that uh, remove this GPS from our syllabus because GPS has the westernized meaning uh, because it belongs to ESA and now the universal name is GNSS and uh, one among the GNSS uh, party is the GPS and you can have uh, different uh, names even uh, they can uh, use uh, Galileo or uh, GLONASS or Beidou or IRNSS and so on. So it's a modern method of collecting the static and dynamic position of objects using a constellation of subject, uh, satellites orbiting over the Earth's surface and uh, continuously transmitting the signals that enable the user to determine the Earth's position. Because now we are using the atomic clock. So in each satellite, you have the atomic clock. And uh, for identifying the position of a particular place or object, you need to have uh, three, four, five satellites position and then uh, depending upon the uh, the time difference in data collection or the, uh, the height is measured and then their position is defined. So as I said earlier, the GPS is American satellite, GLONASS is Russian system, the Galileo is for Union for the Europe, and China is Beidou, and uh, IRNSS is the Indian space system, and now to call this as a net. And the applications are unlimited. Every day, the applications are increasing in uh, size and uh, volume and uh, the, the type. It includes the transport in the uh, sea because uh, it started with the navigation in the sea. And the uh, roads, uh, the airlines, and agriculture, the fishery, civil engineering, energy, toll collection, and whatnot. Everywhere, the GNSS applies. Then the third group of applications is uh, GIS. It is a framework or a system that uh, provides the ability to capture and analyze the geospatial data for preparation of systematic maps to address the problems of the type. Because any uh, system or a subsystem should address the problems of the society. If we have an earthquake, then the system of uh, various elements of geoinformatics uh, is to be considered carefully and used. So in the GIS, we need, uh, we have five components. One is the hardware, as we said, the computer. The second one is the software. The third is the data set. Then be an expert and the application. So the hardware, earlier uh, we used to have the uh, very, very big uh, computers, uh, mainframe computers like LAG and MINOS, they had uh, IBM PC 760 and 70 and so on. That was uh, like, uh, say, 100 uh, square meter area is required, false uh, flooring is required, and so on. That was the hardware. Now you have excellent uh, computing capability. Even your desktop or uh, laptop does uh, wonderful work. 
Then you have the software, probably from 10 or 15 years before we used to pay several lakhs to purchase the software. Now it is almost free and you can download them and you can use it. And the third one is equally important, the data. Uh, some 20 years or 15 years before we used to apply for projects and uh, about a third of the project cost is the time to data. So we used to project uh, the data cost as one third of the project. Now, almost it is free. So in several uh, platforms, you can download the data and you can uh, use the uh, free software and uh, with the Amma computer or any computer or, or laptop, you can make use of them, provided right? you should be an expert. So you should be an expert in geoinformatics, not only in uh, GE, but also in geoinformatics because uh, remote sensing and the GNSS are integral components of uh, geoinformatics. And uh, this uh, G is the application ranges from uh, inventory and management of various resources, then crime mapping, their routes and vehicles, then managing the network, then managing the properties, then locating and targeting the customers, then agricultural crop inventory, then the forest and water. So these are the basic uh, areas in which uh, G is to be applied. So any map you prepare, any thematic map you uh, prepare needs the layers. Maybe the layers could be 10 or 15 or 20 or something like that. So the GIS organizes the geography data in a series of thematic layers and tables. And these data sets are georeferenced and they have uh, the real world locations and overlay one another and then provide the final uh, thematic map. Say for example, some uh, uh, say some 20 years before, when we want to prepare a district map, say for example, going to district map, then the, uh, they have to collect information for uh, uh, just the previous year from land use other and other statistics, and then incorporate all the thematic information in a drawing sheet, and then they prepare for about a month or two. Now it is not like that. If you want to prepare the thematic map or uh, the district map of Coimbatore for 2020, then collecting, collect the information for 2019 and then incorporate, update, and then superimpose one another and then you will get the map. That is the uh, uh, latest technology. And the uh, final component probably we are interested in uh, the remote sensing is the ground penetrating radar. Ground penetrating radar, uh, yes, uh, uh, the application uh, is slightly different from uh, your uh, geophysical uh, instruments. And uh, the ground penetrating radar works up to a few meters depth and uh, the accuracy of understanding because we are using the antenna for uh, identifying the object. And the cost is about uh, 40 lakhs to one crore and so on. So depending upon uh, the kind of antenna we are using. So probably the first left, uh, top left uh, image is uh, the uh, pyramid. And uh, inside the pyramid, uh, you have the chambers and then uh, uh, all other pathways and so on. So if you want to investigate uh, the pathways inside or uh, whatever the, say, the trusses you want to investigate, then you make, make use, uh, use of this uh, GPR instrument and compile them. Then on the right side, top right is uh, investigating the tunnels, the strength of the tunnel. Say, for example, in Calcutta, uh, Chennai, you are uh, constructing the tunnels for uh, metropolitan or uh, uh, the, uh, not the trans, but electric trains or uh, other uh, purposes, uh, metro trains. So for these uh, uh, trains, uh, we need, uh, we, we are constructing the tunnels and we should know the strength of the walls, otherwise it, it would collapse. Therefore, we are using this uh, instrument for finding out the strength of the tunnels. And this is one of the examples. And uh, bottom left is uh, uh, the instrument used for uh, identifying the defect cables and drainage lines. So for example, all along the pavements, beneath the pavements, they have uh, laid, uh, say, the electric cable, telephone cable, and uh, sewerage lines, and drinking water lines, and whatnot. Everywhere you have the uh, lines and uh, cables, and uh, if we have a defect, uh, what we 
now do is that we take this for uh, kilometers together from me some 30 40 years before in uh, chennai mount road you can see the digging of uh, uh, the pavements for kilometers together and now it is not the problem now uh, we, are, we are using the gpr to find out the defects and if you have a defect in a cable electric cable or uh, telephone cable or uh, even uh, sewerage lines then you find out the defect and then take one or two tiles and then repair it and then go. That's it. Uh, there is no need for uh, this. And the fourth one, top right, uh, the bottom right is use of uh, the ground penetrating radar in the military. So if we have a snow cover area and then uh, if uh, the Javan's bodies could not be faced or if you want to investigate some sites or uh, any other uh, thing, hidden things beneath the, surface, the, the snow cover, then you can make use of the ground penetrating data to find out. Say for example, you can see this. So beneath the snow cover, if you have a body, then you can detect this, yes. The, so there is no need to dig all these portions. Probably you can dig only these portions you can, uh, you can take, take out. So mostly we are using the 400 megahertz for most of the surveys. Say for example, in PLD also, they are doing the work and we use only the 400 megahertz for uh, exploration because this uh, GPR is a versatile instrument used mainly in archeological surveys. So besides geology, uh, geographers and the archeologists are doing the survey. So these are all the components I want to say and probably you may appreciate in the next slide. Thank you very much for this. And thank you very much for uh, giving the space in the platform to share my views on geoinformatics through the webinar and through the Department of Geography of Nirmala College. Planning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Is it uh, for uh, discussion or? No, uh, sir, uh, we will finish all the three speakers, then okay. we will have a discussion, sir. Okay, okay, okay. I request you to continue, sir. Right, yeah. Sir, I will now request uh, Dr. Shishir Kumar Dash, Scientist E, National Center for Coastal Research, Ministry of Earth Science, Government of India, to take over the session. So kindly unmute and uh, you can make your video Dash sir, are you there? I'm there very much. Uh, sir, uh, is it audible now? It, it is audible, sir. Your video video is muted, I think. Okay. Is it okay? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can show the slide. Yes, sir. I'll. One second, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank you, the organizers of the one of the prestigious college of Coimbatore. Uh, when I got this invitation first, uh, I was very delighted to know that this is one of the oldest uh, uh, institution of the during Independence time. And uh, today it is a great opportunity for me to deliver a lecture uh, 
particular to the geography fraternity and as well as the remote sensing fraternity uh, in and uh, around the world and uh, during this lockdown it is one of the best initiative i will say that you uh, know uh, that we are doing actually the organizers are doing particularly jyotirmoy so without wasting time i will just go through the slides uh, so i just uh, uh, my previous speaker professor kumar swami has highlighted about the applications of remote sensing upon all the aspect but uh, i will uh, try to uh, summarize you know narrow down my lectures to the coastal applications uh, i'm uh, sk das uh, people call me das and you know um, i am working i was started my career in isro uh, then after that i was doing in phd i did phd in japan um, and then 2009 onwards i went to nccr national center for coastal research uh, so i just go to the my slides next slide please <coughs> next slide please hello sir this is the second slide sir yeah <laughs> not coming ha ah, yes so these are the overall work of you know nccr where we are doing we are working in the four five domains uh, one of the shoreline management coastal hazards uh, maritime pollution marine pollution and particular ecosystem based services capacity building we do the five member approach which is monitoring measurement modeling mapping and management uh, this uh, uh, actually many of the people in the country knows i think icma integrated coastal marine area management which was located in chennai in iot that is renamed just two years back and we are at the full fledged center on coastal research where our team is on the scientific the, the the basic thing is that in the in, in india like country the coast is divided into two ministry i always say that uh, one is ministry of environment and forest and climate change and the ministry of earth sciences ministry of environment forest and climate change they do all the management aspect however uh, uh, ministry of earth sciences is doing all the scientific research on the uh particularly coastal science so 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 based on that we have a longer longer program on pollution solar management is also one of the longest pollution so next slide please next slide please yes sir next one other ways ha huh, yeah so actually as you know that there are a lot of resources you just change yeah, one by one as yes. you know that you know there are a lot of resources uh, there are a lot of resources are there food uh, uh, as you said potential fishing zone from the sea salt water energy minerals coral ecosystem mangrove ecosystem beach coastal there are a lot of things is actually they are in the potential particularly in the exclusive economic zone of a, of a, uh, any country in the having a vast ej the exclusive economic country and as well as we have also a reservoir of oil drug and also there are a lot of aspects like climate change natural disaster etc we have to study so the and we know that there are 40% population lives in the coastal area so the 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 tremendous pressure in the coastal area is immense so we have to know clearly that what is the actually what the uh, coastal communities want and what are the what are the problems are found so for the purpose the ncc are doing all uh, diversified activities i think i will highlight one or two uh, though the due to the time constraint i will try to finish within 30 minutes thank you next slide please next slide yes sir this is the next one tropical cyclone cyclone tidal wave yeah yeah so these are the cyclones yeah it is coming it is coming very slowly to me so these are the tropical cyclone climate change sea level rise we are doing and uh, you know storms or the activities when the tropical cyclone process over that so all this what are the how it is impacting my image giving a major impact 
on the coastal area that also need to be studied. Uh, whereas high wave activity like the western coast in the Gulf of Kutch and as well as Mumbai coast, there is a wherever high, high wave activity, what are the prediction for that? So that is also need to be studied, understood. Next, next slide, please. Audio will is not clear. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we are actually not new. We are almost 22 years old organization where we started our ICJM plan in the Chennai, Goa and Gulf of Kutch, uh, which is called Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan. Critical habitat mapping, one of the mapping which we have done 20 years back, coral reef monitoring, tsunami modeling, mapping, storm surge, oil spill, ecosystem modeling, coastal processes and hazards, coastal change system, coastal pollution, uh, Recently, last two, three years, after 2015 Chennai flood, we went into the coastal areas, you know, to find out the flood warning system. So coastal flood warning system is developed for Chennai and within just last week, it was developed for Mumbai also called integrated flood warning system. Capacity building, we are also like this, we are doing the training for the entire calendar year in the in our office and as well as outside uh, along with the different institutions. So one of the important uh, progress that I was like to highlight here, the coastal process and hazard. As I said, the coastal area is highly vulnerable. And uh, before that, uh, just I want to tell you that uh, Professor Kumarasamy asked me a question that what is the coastline and the shoreline? Actually, technically speaking, coastline, if you, somebody will ask you, where is coastline, where is shoreline? Both are, you know, uh, very difficult to demarcate because not only that, um, wherever, you know, we know that where is the land and ocean, um, uh, meets there is called your coastline however it will depend upon the your high tide line and low tide line so mostly what is happening that the 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 intertidal zone what we call between high tide line and the low tide line there your your shore line moves uh, so it oscillates from uh, between high tide line to low, um, low tide line but uh, there are uh, Actually, this contest when we talk, when we do a little bit intense uh, intense research on that, suppose if you want to know the exactly that how a particular coastline is changing, then then at that time you have to understand what is coastline, how the geomorphology is changing, then you have to tell about the shoreline changing. But if you little bit about know how the sediment pattern is changing, then you have to find out again worm line. Now again, you will ask me why, where is bottom line? Exactly, when you will go to a sea, you will find coastline, shoreline, bottom line, all this in the same line only. Whereas, you know, uh, yeah, high tide line, low tide line is very simple uh, to know that because high tide line is always, you know, we call that, you know, extreme water, whatever comes. It may be sometimes dry or wet, where you will find wet, means the, 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 the sand will be wet. Back, 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 please. Back, please. No. So, so, uh, so there is a difference between shoreline and coastline. However, uh, we found that you know coastal erosion is one of the biggest problem in the entire uh, India, uh, particularly east coast and the west coast. So there are some pictures are there where you know one of the cases is uh, just in front, in front of the sea, and there are a lot of research has been done that how we can reclaim the beach and everything based on the scientific research and uh, do periodic observation required for the scene and what are the co crucial factors are there that we have to understand then we can make some uh, the scientific and the solutions next slide please next Next. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, back, please. Hmm. So, um, again, back. Back. Ah, go to go to the back and front front. Yeah. So these are the actually which NCCR has been done. You know uh, that you know we 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 have taken a solar line change uh, digital uh, change maps where we have find out from 1975 or not from the land side to till today what how the solar line changes over the years. So. Uh, using the satellite uh, data where we have tried to extract the solar line, uh, digital solar line, then we have done the modeling and after that we have, we have found that you know, how the solar line change is really changing and we have taken a lot of factors, I mean, uh, things like uh, your sea level rise into the account. So, so we have mapped almost nine state, 66 listed map and all these maps are available with us. 1 to 25,000 scale map. Even wherever the high eroding area, that also we have identified as a hotspot. And all these hotspots, we have to carefully understand, make periodic measurement of the wave activities, how the wave actually, why actually this erosion is happening, and what, are the, what, what, are, what is to be done in the future. So like that management plans we are suggesting, and that to the state government and the different provinces of the entire mainland India. Next. So, uh, yeah, it is a real-time monitoring, actually, somebody is asking me. Yeah, okay, it is a real-time monitoring we are doing, and uh, wherever we are going, we have taken both the field photographs and as well as periodic measurements, web measurements, current measurement, tide measurement, all these measurements we are doing together. And all these things will be interlinked to a system. So, so that's why it is called a coastline, uh, shoreline line change digital, uh, shoreline line change system. So we call it the coastal change system. So this coastal change system we have developed very recently. Dr. Ares Kankara, he is actually one of the, my colleague, he's the heading this entire division. And this entire division is walking uh, all this area, wherever even storm surge happen, means the cyclone epic process means how the orientation of the beach is changing over, over an incident, over a uh, <coughs> cyclone. That is also need to be understood. So that also will be updated into the system. Next. Next. Now, so uh, there is a, actually based on this, there is a shoreline change maps uh, of uh, 26 years has been studied. And this, uh, this particular report you will find in our website. I think everybody requesting you to go to the nccr.gov.in where you can find this map. And it's a very useful map where you will know the hotspots, how actually eroding places of your uh, of a particular coast is having, having information. We will get it all this. Next. Uh, so this is a, what I was talking about, coastal change system, how it looks, all this map, digital maps, photographs, everything will be there. Next, click. Yeah, you go ahead, no problem. I will, I will tell you where to stop. So like this, the maps will be there, where you will find, you know, wherever red color will be there, that will be high, uh, highly eroding. And all these uh, maps of different uh, 1 is to 20,000 scale will be there. So impact of sea level rise also will be coming into picture. So all these uh, GIS layers will be there. And all these GIS layers, it is not to the open, hello, back, 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 back. Back, back. <laughs> So all this digital actually change system is there already on place, but it is not in the public domain. Uh, but however, it will be because we are uh, we are trying to give this to the public because, to the administrators particularly because in public means it will be having misuse. So it is given to the, all the stakeholders of the state government, particularly and with uh, in association with the state government, the state um, uh, departments, and they are accessible to all this type of maps. 
okay now i would like to tell you about this is about the coastal process this is entire the process studies how a coastline changes is happening over that time now i am as i told you that no we have uh, recently worked with the coastal flood warning system in a slide please so coastal flood warning system uh, when we are doing 2015 as I, all of you might be knowing that we are having a severe flood in chennai so after that you know 2015 flood we have uh, Uh, with a curiosity, we have done a lot of uh, field data. As NCCR is always doing, you know, all hazard, particularly hazards like tsunami. When tsunami happened, we are the first people to the country where we have done the lot of measurements in the things. And after that, you know, a tsunami hazard, uh, tsunami warning station has been established in Inkoys in Hyderabad. However, uh, based on that experience, we have collected few data sets in association with the state government and as well as particularly this product. What I am telling, coastal flood warning system was generated by Honorable Vice President of India in the month of. of last year now so this slide this particular program this particular thing is you know it is a very interesting thing i will tell you in the subsequent slides that how it works actually uh, as you know that the entire urban uh, city more those who are those those are like chennai or bombay or kolkata or kochi where we are near next slide please so Uh, so what wherever this post urban cities are there they are very highly pressure and particularly the particularly their uh, uh, topography is completely different and you know because of this flooding happened due to the lack of drainage and as well as uh, lack of management infrastructure so all this purpose when the flooding happened 2015 we have collected you know the data sets of the how actually based on the gps point you know we collected and finally prepared a first hand map that you know uh, how actually which area is actually severed and from that we know came to know that you know because of the chamberla chambrambakam lake has come uh, what are the discharge them that has come into the into the city uh, so 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 you have to know what how the water is coming what are the water bodies is behaving how the catchment is behaving that means in all in not cell i will tell you how modeling works in particularly a flood warning system there are five components are there Next slide, please. So one is your you have to first understand the weather forecast system, but how real time for your weather forecast will be there. So so you have to get the first weather advisories. How many days durations this flood this rainfall is going to be happen. Then from that input you have to put it into the hydrology. Hydrology is nothing but your wherever there is a catchment is there or where is there is a dam is there. All these things you have to understand carefully. What are the channels system in the river network? Everything you have to understand. So that hydrological things the modeling how much rainfall when it is falling on a particular hydrology, then how actually this much water is coming to the river. So that hydrological modeling you have to do. Then city when the city comes, it is a called your uh, hydraulic. hydraulic why you called because the river will pass through the city and uh, all this city all this city when it passes it it includes you know both the drainage and as well as the lot other the lot of uh, sewage channels will be there so all this also will contribute to the flooding so you have to understand uh, the modeling aspect on hydraulic component so one is uh, weather modeling then is hydrology modeling then there is a hydraulic model and uh, when coastal city when it's coming your uh, when the water from the when if it is a high tide area time the water will not push from the land to ocean so rather than it will obstruct because of the high tide fault so you have to also know the hydrodynamic condition of the particular system so you have to know hydrodynamic modeling also so all these five models if you put it together into a one system then it will be called as a flood warning system river and flooding is different river and flooding is different because that is only based on the hydrology and where if there is a city city like if it is it is if it is flooding then you you can take uh, both hydrology and as well as hydraulic however in a, in coastal flooding what is happening one added advantage is that that the, the sea side what is hydrodynamic how the tide is behaving so that things have to be clearly understood so there is a cinematic flow chart is there that i think i will share with you there are a lot of uh, you have to understand hydrology you have to get schematic maps you have to 
you have to know so this is the uh, this is the flood warning system look like you know where you can do you know real time what is actually happening how much rainfall is happening on how after that you know once modeling happen how how many wards is putting going to be affected that to information we have to give to the administrator so this is this uh, this way we have uh, this is our actually uh, chennai flood warning system dashboard where you can real time when the when the, when the rainfall is happening you can give you that on how how actually this entire uh, flooding is happening in ward wise level so ward level information you will get and the report report the up to the dissemination that means report preparation purpose also this warning system will be helpful next 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 so similar system actually this is one week back uh, seven days back we inaugurated by the honorable vice honorable uh, minister of uh, uh, minister of health sciences and the uh, chief minister of maharashtra udav thakre i think uh, i will share a video with you i will give the link i think jyotirmay that uh, you can give the youtube link to the, all the participants so that they, they can uh, see whenever there is a laser but uh, just two minutes i want to share you that how actually this uh, uh, i flows means integrated flow in flood warning system for bombay was all because bombay is also having a same pressure so i think you can see this video sound sound is not coming i think better jyotirma you can give this uh, youtube link to the participants so that they can see them you can see. skip skip Mm. Yeah, sound is not coming i think mm. i think i think you can skip this video uh we can share the slides uh, this particular bridge is in already new to we placed just two days back before in new to i think i will share this this video you can see that uh, so these are the so this is the way actually we can do the all this uh, modeling aspect and you know dissemination model so all this uh, so you need lot of bathymetric data for that purpose you have to understand what is the the where is the river is there where the nalas are there or drainage system drainage network is also has to be incorporated in this is it audible now yes audio yeah yeah thank you thank you uh, so we have done this work with uh, all the mois institutions where we get all the in because weather input we always get from our ministry so that's why it is very easy for us to do with complete this project within 3 years this is the, all the uh, you know arg stations ringa stations so that real time data set is also required to understand the flooding anyway this video i think i will skip uh, jyotirma you can skip this video yes sir yes sir 
Uh, okay, now this is the slide. So, coastal vulnerability. So, uh, this is one aspect. So, after that, you know, how this flooding, because most importantly, everybody is talking about climate change. So, we all are concerned to the climate change, whether it is a frequent uh, number of cyclones coming in a year uh, or because of the global sea level temperature, sea level, uh, sea surface temperature, increase of sea surface temperature. So, sea level rise, the impact of sea level rise to the coastal area need to be understand how it is affecting to the entire community. So, that's why this is uh, one sea level rise scenario we have generated for the Chennai. So, this type of work also we NCCR is doing. Uh, we need a lot of GIS into this and as well as satellite data. Uh, let us satellite data. Next. Uh, so, as I told you that observation is one of the most important factor, but uh, remote sensing uh, uh, will do uh, replace all these things because you cannot go traditional oceanography or any coastal science if you see it will start all the observations start with a ship or instrument. But every time you cannot do, so that's why we have taken alternate. You go to the next slides. Skip the slides, no problem. Continue. Huh? Wherever I will tell you to stop, you just stop it. So, uh, so changing with the time, remote sensing is the only platform where you can do the entire map the world. And uh, recently I have just, uh, so this is for your information. Very recently I think that, just back back slowly. So this is uh, the sea surface temperature of uh, uh, that is sea surface salinity. The previous was one of sea surface temperature. Uh, yeah, this is the sea surface temperature uh, of the entire Indian Ocean. And uh, that is from the GRSST. -S -S this is actually a, a, a composite of SST, different type of SST available in the world ocean. And uh, that uh, uh, next is sea surface salinity. So this is sea surface salinity and uh, uh, this is the ocean current. Ocean current is, you know, the most important thing is part to understand the ocean current. Because ocean current, uh, if you see, ocean current understanding is that there is only one current. Though it has a different name in as per the region wise, uh, whether if it is coming to the uh, Western Arabian Sea, Confinland Jet, if it is uh, in the uh, and Indonesian side, it is ITG to flow through. So uh, in the in the North American, it has having the Caribbean jet. So all these Caribbean areas you have. But if you see this, all are interlinked, and this current bring entire circulation pattern into the ocean, and there you will find lot of uh, changes, particularly in the water, whether it is a sediment whether it is just blooming, whether it is a phytoplankton. So all these things is happening because of movement of the water. So movement of water purpose, we have to understand <coughs> ocean current. But ocean current purpose, there is no such satellites is available. However, uh, is an indicator of a sea surface temperature. If you see the sea surface temperature images very closely, you will find the similar type of, you know, very interesting eddies. That means the curly type of, you know, pictures where you are seeing in this video, you see the curly type of pictures. So these are the curly pictures called eddies. So this eddies also you will find in the sea surface temperature images. Uh, and this sea surface temperature images, you will find out the current. So it is an indirect way to estimate the current by using this remote sensing of satellite data. And this type of information is highly essential to understand the climatology of the uh, particularly ocean environment and as well as the impact. Next. Next, next. Uh, so this is one of the uh, recent cyclone of the last month, you know, there is a cyclone happening uh, which is crossed in the Bay of, Beng Bay of Bengal called Ampan. So after the cyclone also we have to know that you know how actually this impact on the coastal areas that need to be understand. So we have done during this cycle, this lockdown period also the 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 observations from the local institutions who are actually involved in this with us. So 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 because because precipitations we will get it from the whatever IMD says or IMD forecast will be there. But uh, the impact on the in the vulnerability side. We have to. So we are. We are doing for this. And uh, uh, next, uh, 
this is again you know very recent i think 13th may 2000 huh. when a cyclone crosses why i want to say you see the temperature of two images when a cyclone crosses on fun cyclone crosses between 13 to 25th may now you see the 13 so suppose a cyclone crosses what was happening to the coast to the to the ocean environment you see there uh, i think previous images of the sea surface temperature on 13 was little you know yeah 13 yeah you see this this is a little dark higher temperature whereas in the in the uh, in the when it is 25th it is low temperature actually okay so uh, it is exposed now 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 i will show you the next slide yeah this is actually a chlorophyll you know chlorophyll is nothing but a microscopic organism which is available in the water water it is a it is a it is a blue green algae now it is actually on the 13th may like this you just point out the omphan cyclone crossed on 20th now 22nd what happened next next slide yeah so see suddenly your blooming happened that means what happened when a cyclone crosses all what will happen it will having a all equal money ekman pumping will be happening the, the the intermixing of water will happen because of the strong wind and current both the things happen when the, that, that will happen your phytoplankton enrichment will happen the phytoplankton enrichment means what the blooming will be happening so when the blooming will be happening you will get a beautiful fish catch so mostly what will happen after the cyclone you will get a very good fish catch uh, particle. so so you see the so the entire uh, so the red color part you no know, it shows you know high concentration of phytoplankton whereas you know before cyclone there is no phytoplankton in the there is a mild phytoplankton were there because they are dispersed but however in after cyclone it is thoroughly mixed so so the the, the that means the water become highly productive next So when a cyclone also crosses, you know, uh, that, you know, you have to also understand, uh, you have to collect the sea surface wind uh, and as well as because uh, uh, we have a different systems also like HF radar system that also will give you major pattern. But uh, wherever the HF radar is having a limitation up to 200 kilometer, however, if that is not the sea, only satellite data, you can do the sea surface wind by a scatterometer. And this type of data sets also available with ISRO. Next. This is one one picture of the phylum cyclone, uh, and this is the actually your uh, photosynthetic active, uh, I think, uh, radiation. So these are the radiation actually how much solar irradiation is coming into the picture. This is the blooming what I am talking. So it is one case study. You know, blooming will looks like this, but if you zoom it further, you know how enrichment. So these are the actually highly productive areas. So these highly productive areas you need to understand their biology and uh, from that you have to know actually what is the car because ocean is always called as a you know uh, one of the largest uh, think of carbon sinking so 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 you will know the particular organic carbon and inorganic carbon how the carbon actually changing so that is also you can understand this is actually organic carbon the previous image was inorganic carbon so where you will see that you know if you in the indian ocean your northwest arabian sea is highly productive because of the there is a strong current in that and so that's why that particular area is very highly compared to the bay of bengal is a productive point of view now this is the primary productivity of the images where you can see the primary production and that will be helpful to the fisheries next so this is the actually different type of as uh, as i said this is the biology side but now we will come to the wave side wave parameters also we can do there is a uh, uh, lot of instruments uh, there in the uh, remote sensing point of view so altimeter will be quite useful for the to measure the significant wave height and uh, this significant wave height you can easily uh, you will find out any expert any you will simply type in google significant wave height from the satellite you will find a lot of altimeter data sets available right now in isro also having a one server saral altica so this is the saral altica image where you can see the indian mission. this is indian mission but now it is off down now it is actually not down it is not in the orbit but however the old data sets you will find in the, the mosdaq website of isro so next uh, yeah now i'm talking about the just another five to uh, ten five five slides i think uh, actually i would like to talk about the coastal regulation zone when you're talking about you know coast uh, you people as i told you the high tide line and our high water line or low water line you have to carefully understand you know very carefully what is the coastal regulatory zone because as per the uh, law and as well as the you know minister of environment forest and climate change 
the demarcation is very clear so when a satellite image when we are analyzing we have to very much careful about to understand how the low water line how the water line how the high water lines are there where there is a you know as i told you there's a dark pixel you know dark pixel will be there sorry wet pixel will be there that area you can easily tell as that it is a low water line whereas uh, if you know over the tidal correction after you do then you will get the high water line so all these things has to be done when you are doing a taking care of the satellite image very carefully particularly high resolution satellite data is concerned next go next yeah uh, so so because the crz is uh, crz mapping is highly uh, useful uh, when you do any type of uh, management practices and you know if you study if you want to study different type of hdl hdl crz boundary you can map like this and uh, you can study the mod plot you can mangrove uh, degradation over the time how it is happening so different type of you know geomorphological pictures also you can find out and all these things you can do and this is one example i think i have taken from the list four images of 2006 in goa so this is actually this is the crz map of goa so this particularly goa you can see uh, different type of classifications are there and these classifications you can can do by using uh, different type of uh, digital image classifications and uh, from a different uh, satellite data and this next slide yeah next is next we will come about the coral reef coral reef study is one of the most important part because satellite cannot uh, uh, penetrate into this however you know a satellite can give you the sparse uh, uh, variation of the chlorophyll particularly coral reef however strict observation is required but however if you know a basic diving or sort of measurements particularly spectral signature of the particularly corals then you can do a very good work we have done actually one coral reef walking down right now it is going on in the man in the rameshwaram one of my colleagues is also we have a center there and these are the certain things you know where you when we very analyze uh, a satellite data high resolution satellite data we will find htl ltl and uh, mangrove salt pan platforms mangrove intertidal zone coral reef areas so where you know now you will see how in a short notice i cannot tell you but you know if you see little bit in those who are in those who have done into the digital image uh, processing they might be knowing that you know which uh, there are a lot of in a single image you will find a lot of features but uh, to identify properly as as my previous speaker also telling you know because this because there is red color is there that is so with the green vegetation that means it is called your mangrove right so wherever there is a bright picture is there what is that that is sand so because sand reflects more so that's why wherever there is a sand is there is a brightest side is there you know coral sand is there coast coral coralline sand if you zoom it you can see that you know there it is actually all this coral all this coral things you will find out and the intertidal zone also you will find out dark pixel wet pixel all these things classification you can nicely see this is one one of the picture of list three images which is uh, almost uh, and uh, if you see the if like this images if you take periodically over a time you will know that how mangrove is changing i think uh, ms swaminathan foundation is doing an extensive work on this i think my next speaker will speak about all this i think uh, mangrove uh, you know over the over the period uh, uh, you have to know that it is not necessary that every time mangrove degrades sometime we found that you know mangrove regenerate it, it will because of the plantation and plantation activity and everything sometime the mangrove grows also so so we have to but understand that you know ultimately you know you have to understand particularly every time the the continuous measurement and continu continuous mapping is required to understand you know how the mangrove is changing on the particular area next so this is actually one of the, the important thing i was telling about you know when there is a port there is a environmental monitoring when when anor port this the two images you are seeing anor port was not there that is in i think 1999 i think and another is 2001 i think during that time anor port came so during that time you know when anor port came how actually the fly was 
fly ash outfall was there and uh, how it is actually impacting the environment that was one case study we have done during 1999 time so this is the so we have satellite image was using very heavily even now also during the top of the north of uh, nor port there is a island sea there where you know this uh, SAR center, ISRO centers were there. So they are also how it is changing. So every time, you know, this type of satellite image will be useful for environmental monitoring. Next. Next. Yeah. So tsunami purpose, you know, this is actually a picture of tsunami. The first uh, footprint of the tsunami images when the 2004 tsunami happened. This is the first image of uh, tsunami in the Marina Beach in Chennai. And uh, this type uh, during the during that time, you know, we have taken a huge uh, lot of uh, effort to collect the data because when the over a period of three to four four hours, uh, you will find that water comes, uh, water recedes. So. So the shoreline orientation will change and you don't know the impact of the water, how actual water comes and when the water recedes. So during that time, uh, there are a lot of life, uh, life was lost. So, so I think uh, uh, 2004 was a landmark here to, for the, all the science uh, fraternity to understand the tsunami into, seriously into this, uh, particularly for the, in India. So that type of research we have done and the uh, impact of uh, and another side is that, you know, there is a biggest thing I would like to tell you that uh, minister also doing a lot of work on uh, erosion, as, you, as I told you in my previous time, erosion, erosion, why it happens? Suppose somebody will ask me why erosion happens? Erosion is happening because of the high wave activity, particularly if a storm surge happens or a particular man-made like, you know, if a port comes. If a if a port comes, what will happen? Where always you will find that you know northern side in in the east coast. I'm telling you, only east coast side. Your 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 north side will be road, and you know southern south will be accreted. If you take an example of Chennai port, before you know before 90s 90s, this Chennai there was no marina beach. There is a very, I'm telling you, there is no Marina Beach because port was not there. However, when the port came into the early uh, beginning of 90s, after that happened, the accretion happened. Because of why the accretion happened? Because of the sediment movement. When the sediment moves from north to south in the east coast and the west coast it is just opposite, it will come from the north to uh, south, whereas it is from south to north. In east coast, it is south to north. When it moves to south to north, all this, uh, because of the structures, your southern side will be accreted. When the southern side will be accreted, because of the sand it will not pass, so it will having, uh, the wave will be go in, in, it will go inside into the land, in the northern side. So northern side will be highly eroding. So there the problems comes. So that's why a sustainable management is to be required. That's why ICMAM, uh, our uh, office was started in 19 98 in Anna University and uh, we got the first project in the ICJM uh, concept in the country for Chennai. So during that time only we came to know that you know because you have to understand you know sustainable means what? Sustainable means the shoreline orientation should be balanced. So somebody has to we have to do you have to protect our coast very carefully. So that's why this type of problems happens but we give also technical solution to them. Okay I think uh, next Uh, so these are the shoreline changes. If you see that, you know, over a period of uh, uh, 10, uh, 5 to 7 years, every time, you know, it does sometimes sand goes, sometimes sand comes. So sand will be replaced. So we have to find out how much volume of the sand actually. So ultimately what I want to say in a nutshell that, you know, uh, remote sensing, if you talk, uh, it is a, uh, for me, I can define, remote sensing can give you a bigger picture. However, it is technology and human beings should go in hand in hand to interrupt to interpret correctly then only your uh, remote sensing will be very much useful of course uh, now presently hyperspectral remote sensing came with a lot of bands lot of research has to be required to do because that is uh, that is the only the future of remote sensing if you talk it is called hyper uh, hyperspectral remote sensing so i think uh, uh, this uh, things i will request all the people who want to do any type of research Please communicate to us. Okay. Uh, with my last slide, I would like to thank you. 
that uh, giving a beautiful picture of Mansarabar. It is again, you know, list four images, Indian satellite images of Mansarabar. Thank you for your kind attention. I am sorry that you know there are a lot of uh, problem in the audio and video, uh, but uh, I was uh, very much interested to know to be part of. Uh, uh, to go to this particular college to address this, but uh, due to lockdown, it has never happened. But in future, I think I will get the opportunity to go and uh, give a lecture to them. I think, thank you for your attention. If any questions are there, I can quickly take and I can answer. Uh, somebody is asking me, one minute, so many questions. Uh, sir, can we take the questions afterwards? One more speaker has to go now, sir. Uh, we will okay. take, we'll take after the session, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you for your nice lecture, sir. It was nice, uh, very kind of you. Uh, it was nice to hear you. So I would like to request uh, Mr. Nagarajan, R. Nagarajan, scientist and head, GIS in remote sensing, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. Yeah, is my screen is uh, visible? Yes, it's visible. You can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. good evening to all. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me for this webinar. Uh, it's my really pleasure to address a mixed group of uh, academicians, scientists, and students. Uh, and I uh, thank the management and the organizer for these uh, opportunities. Uh, already, the, my previous speakers, Professor uh, Kumar Sane, has, uh, has given a benchmark about the basic satellite sensing and GIS, and uh, Dr. Das has given uh, more insight about the coastal zone applications as well as the uh, ocean actual applications. So I'll be uh, talking more about the uh, application of GIS and remote sensing in rural development in our uh, foundation. So. For persons who do not know about our foundation, it is uh, MS Swaminathan Foundation. So you all know who is MS Swaminathan Research, MS Swaminathan. He is the father of the Revolution. He started his organization in 1988 with his first uh, award of uh, World Food Prize. So we have completed recently 30, uh, 30 years, and we have an interdisciplinary team of scientists, researchers, scholars, uh, development workers in the, in the teams of agriculture, nutrition, biotechnology, uh, biodiversity coastal zone management, climate change, and gender and communication. Uh, GIS and remote sensing is, as you all know, that it, it is uh, it is one of the tools which I can use for any uh, any department. So we, it's a cross-cutting department in our foundation. So we use GIS and remote sensing extensively for coastal system researchers, uh, food security, eco-technology, biodiversity, and as well climate change. So I'll be sharing some of my uh, uh, case study, how the GIS and remote sensing application has been used in our foundation works. So as my previous speaker, S.K. Das has pointed out that the foundation is one of the pioneering organizations in uh, uh, working in the mangrove restoration. Uh, from uh, almost the east coast of uh, India, we start from Bidar Kanika, uh, East Kodavari, Krishna mangroves, and uh, uh, coast of uh, Tamil Nadu. And recently we started some of work in uh, Maharashtra also. Okay, so what we're seeing is the mangrove restoration. So before uh, mangrove restoration, how the area has been prepared and uh, uh, 2004, you can see how the mangrove has been restored. So there, how the GIS and remote sensing has been used for this purpose actually. So you all know that uh, mangrove, particularly the mangrove ecosystem is not a very, a very easy accessible forest. So it is completely muddy forest and you can't go deep into the forest and find where the land is degraded and that is where the real problems have it. For that sake, only the uh, I would say the only the efficient tool is the remote sensing. Without remote sensing satellite image, you can't find even single place where the mango has been degraded, where the elevation, what are the factors in the mango degradation happened, so so on and so forth. So you can see in the monitor we're seeing is the monitoring and mapping of mango wetland. This the image what you're seeing is the East Godavari of Andhra Pradesh uh, Pradesh district. And our organization is working almost for 25 years in the mango registration. Uh, and after the tsunami, it it's, it's becomes very healthy for the uh, fishing community as well as uh, coastal, coastal, coastal communities. Because, you know, as Professor, uh, I mean, Professor Yana Swamnavan has coined the word bioshield. The mangrove ecosystem is called the bioshield, actually. So it is, it tops a cyclone, I mean, it minimizes cyclones and the uh, storm surge as well as the sea level rise and so on. So all, all the climate things. 
So image in the image what we are seeing is a 1986 uh, Landsat image and uh, 86 Landsat image and 2008 and so on. I can see. So once we started our uh, restoration effort, as you can see, this light one, light colors. So these are the area which is completely degraded mangroves. So as a GS and remote sensing persons, we identified where that exactly that the degraded is there, and the, the mangrove ecologist. We have a mangrove, very good mangrove ecology team with us. And the mangrove ecologist. <laughs> Sorry, Nagraj, you have to unmute yourself. Some participants have unmuted. So. Okay, can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, am, I, am I audible? You are audible. You are audible. Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay, so, Mangrove just started uh, mangrove plantation in that uh, Beirut area. So, the, the JS, the remote sensing is used here for planning purpose as well as monitoring. So once the planning, we'll say, hey, go and do the plantation over here. And they do the plantation and everything would they do it. And over the period of time, we also monitor the growth of the uh, mangroves, like the health of the mangroves. So you can see the last image, see so how the brighter uh, the images is actually. As you said, that this is a false composite image, the mangroves are very bright, and very bright. So based on this, uh, remote sensing is effectively used for monitoring the mangroves, uh, for the restoration and everything actually. So this is the only way you can monitor the mangroves, uh, uh, ma monitor the mangrove or restoration. So again, this is the same image for, uh, uh, I mean, this is a different image for Krishna mangroves. This is also the, uh, the state of Andhra Pradesh. So you can see here uh, this part, so how it was earlier actually. It's completely, there is no vegetation at all actually. You can, you can see this part actually. So over the period of time, once our restaurants with the forest department, it is not with the foundations that are doing the restoration because most of the forest, most of the mango regions comes under reserve forest and uh, some of the non reserve forest also. So with the effective participants of the community, forest department and uh, foundations, we restored the, the mangroves of the Krishna mangroves also. And this one is a Pichawar mangroves, you can see. The, you can see the, this is an Arjigiri image. You can see here, the, the, what are the patches? You can see these are the patches where it is almost a degraded mangroves. And after our intervention, you can see how the mangrove has been uh, restored over this year, year actually. So how it is benefited for the rural people actually. So as you all know that a mangrove forest is almost a reserve forest. And most of the mangrove forests are nowadays is a very good tourist spot. So because of the more tourists, uh, tourists are visiting the mangrove areas, it, it gives more revenue to the uh, community who are belongs to the ecosystem, as well as it's a very good uh, fishing, uh, fishing uh, to cross part actually, because you know the uh, it is a nest for the fishes and uh, things actually. So uh, the far, the, I mean, the community who are near to that uh, mangrove, mangrove ecosystems, they go for fishing and uh, they will get a very good rainy in the daily basis. And uh, we also do uh, this, what you're seeing almost, uh, you can see the images actually. This one is the Pichawar mangrove in Tamil Nadu uh, from 1977 in Landsat image. So this is one uh, thematic map generated from uh, satellite images. You can see the over the period of time from 1977 how it was in 87 after our interventions you can see the, the complete region becomes a green actually it's almost restored now the Pichar mangrove is completely restored actually so it has a lot of uh, uh, potential for uh, tourism also and almost the foundation has uh, I mean restored 400 hectares of mangroves in that particular region okay and next is like uh, we also do some uh, simulation studies so as my previous speakers uh, Dr. Das spoke so we do simulation study for uh, uh, as per IPCC codes. We do simulation if there is a sea level rise of 0.5 meter or 1 meter and so on. So we see how much area of the mangrove, of the mangroves and the associated the villages will get affected. So the map you are seeing the pink one is if there is a 0.5 meter sea level rise. So you can see what are the, how many regions are uh, get inundated. Like uh, of course agriculture will get flood inundated and some of villages also could be wiped out actually. So these are the studies also we are, take, we are taking and uh, we give this to the uh, um, uh, policy makers and based on this, the policy makers will decide for the I mean, adaptation strategies and other things. And the other work is next work. We, we do some uh, vulnerability analysis work for Karnataka Coast also. Uh, we, have, we work closely with the government of Karnataka. Uh, the map, what you are seeing is the entire uh, Karnataka coast has been uh, mapped using the high resolution display satellite image. 
uh, for vulnerability analysis studies. And uh, we do extensively, we work for biosphere and agriculture. This part, actually, I'll, I'll show the next slide. So you can see this is very simple. Uh, I mean, uh, vulnerability analysis we did actually. If there is a, as I said earlier, if there is a 0.25 meter, or 0.5 meter, or 0.75 meter, or one meter, how much area, how much area will get under? This is one of the estuaries in uh, uh, North Karnataka. It's called Aganashni Estuary. And this the government of Karnataka want to know how much area will get inundated and how much area will get saline uh, in the future. And they also, also want to know how much area is saline now, actually. Because, you know, most of the people say this is this uh, almost a coastal saline, coastal saline, actually, but nobody knows where exactly the saline is happening, actually. Well, nobody has demarketed properly, actually. So, in this context, we have taken uh, two stories in that uh, Karnataka coast, actually. One is not in uh, Karnataka, and the southern one is called Panjaganda Oli Stories. Uh, you can see this, if there is a 0.5 meter, this particular area is uh, completely inundated actually. So, we'll get inundated. And the, most of the region is almost now it is completely saline actually. So, uh, our foundation is, we have a very good biotechnology team in the foundation actually. So, they work on the alternative, uh, uh, alternative uh, saline, saline tolerant crops also they are working actually. So, we tested that crops here actually, here in that part, that, uh, the, this particular region. Uh, for that, uh, it has been very highly used to for them actually. So you can see this is one is uh, we also work on high resolution satellite image. This was the the, um, the sand index mapping. What you are seeing is from the uh, world view satellite image, which is almost 1.5 meter, uh, um, 1.5 meter uh, in color or GB, and the pan is almost 2.5 meter actually. So you can see here of uh, this particular region, this one is called Manikata Gajni region, uh, completely the complete this area is saline. And uh, we did extensive study for this region actually, how much area, each, each, I mean, the study is like uh, each land, whether it is saline or not. Not only we are not, we are not relying on uh, remote sensing also, we do em 30 survey also actually. So we perfect the EC in that one. So we coupled together a model actually. So we use uh, field survey as well as remote sensing images and we do a modeling and we say these are the areas will uh, almost to saline now and there might be a possibility of saline to further also. So to arrest that, uh, to arrest that one that biosphere and agriculture people and government of Karnataka is planning so many things actually like uh, putting cold water, I mean putting a check dam and arrest the water, see what in, so many things that they're, they're doing actually. So they're also using uh, remote sensing essentially and uh, this one, uh, I mean leaving away from coast. So we do species distribution also. This what we're seeing is a Mandya district. Mandya district of uh, Karnataka. So for one of the, I mean, uh, one of the project we just worked on the spatial distribution of ragi. Uh, so ragi is a major crop for the, uh, I mean, a major uh, crop as well as the Karnataka people consumes more ragi. So you can see from the 2005, 2009, and 2015 how much area has been changed over the period of time actually. Because people have the statistical data, but most of the time the statistical, as you all know, that statistical data is not related, not really reliable. So the remote sensing, we did the analysis, like uh, we have taken, uh, in, we can take in the five, I mean, those five to, to 15 satellite images. We did the uh, temporal change analysis, and based on temporal change analysis, we we found that there is an uh, increase of uh, increase of area of ragi cultivation. From 2005 to 2009, and 2009 to 2015, there is a there is a drastic decrease of almost 6,700 hectares of uh, uh, I mean hectares. They didn't uh, do they didn't go for uh, magi, I mean uh, ragi cultivations. So what I'm trying to say is like this kind of uh, crop distribution and uh, change analysis other things also can be carried out using the remote sensing using the using the remote sensing. And the other one is like uh, uh, recently we did one project which is called the GS based forewarning model for a pest and uh, disease management in the coastal agriculture weather. So we are the only organization, I would say the only organization in India, we try to address the farmers in the land to land actually. So most of the advice is what we're giving from, what we're getting from the government of India or, uh, or KNAU or any other organization, they'll give for the, briefly for the district level and now they're trying to give for a block level also actually. But uh, we try to give land-to-land uh, -land, uh, information in their own languages, in their uh, I mean, colloquial language itself. Actually. So this is uh, infographics of that uh, of that particular project. Actually, so the picture speaks more than uh, uh, the picture. 
so we developed a, in this part of the project we developed a geo agri portal actually so in the geo agri portal uh, we did a cadastral so we digitized a complete cadastral uh, maps of the weather and in block which is a coastal area so you can see this uh, clear coastal area and uh, in other next step we did an fmb level uh, mapping actually because in you know, a cadastral do not have uh, land info, land ownership information so we went to fmb level so what you can see is three these are the three uh, uh, project villages we did the fmb level uh, mapping and uh, fmb level map has been done all the information of agriculture i mean the farmers information has been completely digitized and tagged with uh, with the field measurement fmb actually so and uh, whatever the dots were seeing is a soil or soil uh, monitoring we regularly monitor the soil while post and pre monsoon so we have a we have a exclusive well soil testing van with us and uh, the mobile testing van go to the farmers field and they do for they do the plant i mean test soil testing and give the results immediately and we also use extensively we use uh, remote sensing images like sentinel uh, as i use simple images to have ndva simple ndva like if there is any uh, drastic changes in the uh, soil i mean crop and other things also we are giving and we have uh, our own weather station also placed in the Uh, in the particular in the block actually so we are uh, we are collaborating with the tamil nadu agriculture industry also for uh, weather modeling part of so also we are giving real time weather uh, weather forecast by every uh, every 30 minutes we are getting regularly data it is updated in the dashboard also and uh, in connection to that uh, uh, we developed an app called the panna app which is called patient disease advance notifications and need based agriculture information so the whatever whatever we developed the uh, geo agri portal it has been transferred to the anna app uh, it is a android based app the per, i mean the farmers can be downloaded in their mobile and they can use it on, they can use it so the special thing about this is like you know there are so many apps are developed and it is also uh, it's also used by people like different farmers also and here you can see the view my land so whatever the person whatever the farmer is the farmer's land i mean information is given that he has been tagged to that he can view his land actually so not only viewing his land all the satellite images has been posted on that land actually uh, like uh, every 15 days we take uh, central images and it has been uh, given to them and based on that he can no uh, actually the point is like uh, they are not making any decision actually we are making decision but uh, uh, but we are also educating them to how to use this kind of uh, app, uh, 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 use this kind of applications and the second tab is weather forecast and agri agri advisories so we give a general agri advice to the, all the farmers and the market price and send me crop uh, this one is a very very good uh, uh, i mean intervention send me crop pictures so as you all know that right now we have the, we are in the covid situation and people are uh, changing their body and things so so this app is i mean this particular component is very useful for the farmers like uh, they can send a picture or a video and uh, record it the voice and send it to us actually so immediately our uh, team was sitting in the chennai office or in the weather and site office itself and they will give a solution to the to the farmers actually. so this like connecting the farmers and the scientists immediately so we can give the solutions immediately to the farmers uh, in terms of voice as well as uh, in the video for video formats also then the regular things and queries and the government of schemes also uh, will be it so this app is launched by the government of uh, i mean uh, it and agriculture ministers of government of tamil nadu and this is well taken by the farmers and almost right now uh, 10000 farmers are uh, uh, indirect beneficiaries and direct benefits almost 2000 farmers uh, for this uh, for this project and we are hoping to extend this project uh, to the next level also because right now we are doing only for the weather and the block so we are just developing a model here and the weather and the block is a model we have developed actually so this model can be implemented throughout the tamil nadu or any other states actually because you know government of because you know it is it is more of uh, giving information rather uh, more of uh, giving information to the farmers so we all have the cadastral map the fmb map other things how we can collate everything and give it that how uh, we can give advices to each farmer so is one of the key projects i think and uh, uh, this is one of the this is very important project which i want to discuss this with the community actually uh, we are working with this one is an indo german bilateral project uh, we are working closely with the government of tamil nadu and uh, giz and stock rural department also okay so you all know that ngnrj is one of the uh, one of the biggest project in the country 
वाले गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इस पंपिंग नागराज काइंडली अनम्यूट या या आई कैन हियर मी हेलो यस यस इट्स ऑडिबल इट्स ऑडिबल इट्स ऑडिबल या 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 ओके सो द एमजीएनआरईजे इज वन ऑफ द वन ऑफ द वन ऑफ द बिगेस्ट प्रोजेक्ट इन द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इटसेल्फ एक्चुअली सो ड्यूरिंग दिस कोविड सीजन कोविड सीजन यू कैन सी लाइक मोस्ट ऑफ द मनी इज पंप्ड इनटू द एमजी एमजीएनआरईजे स्कीम Where the rural uh, rural people can get more benefit actually. So, you know, lakhs and lakhs of money has been pumped into this M G N R G A. So, how the work has been monitored? How the work has been planned actually? So, for my it's, it's uh, almost six months before even I, I didn't know about this project actually. So, once we came into this one actually, I was really surprised to know that they extensively use G I S and remote sensing in planning as well as monitoring. Actually. Okay, so I want to share you some of the some of our work with the GIS, which is a German international organization, uh, and Government uh, of Tamil Nadu. Um, okay, so uh, they do a lot of uh, social economic analysis also, or uh, non-spatial, which is called non-spatial analysis. Also, they do. I'm going to talk more about our uh, spatial uh, spatial subject again. So for uh, any G, what they call gram panchayat, for any gram panchayat, they have a plan. Actually. So how this plan? So far, uh, before the plan is not not really done properly in the scientific manner. Government of India has, has felt that it has to be done scientifically. So most of the works in the MGNRJ you have seen in our gram panchayat, like they do always. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean clearing and the bun strengthening other things. Actually. But the government of India want to do uh, works. Actually, they have almost 200 and 200 200 plus works. For the NGN RJ, but in our region, you can see only three or four works have been done actually. So, government of India has trained all the rural development engineers in that one, and uh, they also had, uh, hired uh, consultants like us, and we are also working closely. We are training them actually. So, I'm going to tell you guys how this how this uh, GB level planning is happening, and if you guys are interested, even you can also be part of this uh, uh, Gram Panchayat or planning. Because you know most of we are living in the Gram Panchayat actually, so uh, Gram Panchayat the people are using GIS and the geographer and spatial analyst people can be part of that one, and they can also involve in the planning actually, and can also help the uh, engineers and your village presidents also. So the structure here is like a uh, we generate uh, so many thematic maps and uh, the required for the planning. And the thematic maps has been put into uh, the thematic has been overlaid, and uh, based on the overlay, the plan I mean overlay, the different planning has been done. Actually, so I will show you how it has been done. Actually, so I'll just give this one. I'll just give this one. So these are the important uh, spatial information uh, data uh, they are using for each gram panchayat. Uh, starts from watershed, land reserve, wasteland, soil erosion, salt affected areas, and geomorphology, geology, elements, and groundwater prospects, and everything. How do you get this map? Actually, you all know the Bhuvan. Actually. So, Bhuvan is a portal which is hosted by ISRO and RSC. Actually, so they have a huge data of uh, all the GIS and remote sensing data. So, this particular project essentially uses all this remote sensing, I mean GIS data, all thematic layers actually. So uh, this is just a screenshot to so, to so what is about the Bowen data, and for each state they have given a specific data actually the ge geomorphology or uh, geology or land use things. So each state they can take and they can work on it, work on it also. So this will be very useful for the students and academicians also. Here thereafter we don't need to worry where will the geology, where will the geomorphology other things. So all this data has been pulled in the uh, uh, Bowen portal. Where you can just uh, put your share file and you can do all your analysis and you can take the output, or even you can connect to a WNS server here and you can uh, you can work on uh, all this data also. Actually. So uh, I'll just give one uh, I mean snapshot of this. I can't do hands-on actually uh, with the bandy things. So what you are seeing is one gram panchayat actually. This is called the uh, Lady Gram Panchayat in Tirunamal district actually. So you can see the gram panchayat has been taken. uh different uh, hydrology maps so the because in earlier people they do not know about uh, i mean they don't have proper map of the hydrology or uh, the land use pattern of that map 
even they they are not aware of their boundary also uh, now the village panchayat boundary also they don't want you but here uh, we are we have given this one clearly to the uh, to the planners as well as the uh, village college panchayat presidents and this is your boundary and you can plan it like that uh, all these things we have given watershed this is a watershed map so watershed map they got they got the map watershed map and based on the watershed they can go ahead and do all this all this uh, uh, i mean plantation strengthening of uh, strengthening of uh, the bands and other thing actually okay? so they can do it. and as i said this is a drainage map uh, once 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 they got the drainage map they can know they can know where the drainage has been set and where it ends in the ground pond and based on that they can do the uh, bund strengthening and the desiltation work and other things they can plan and uh, this has been monitored also also because you know uh, that's a good of the most something and if they do any work and maybe after five or the two years you can you can just monitor that one work also and the groundwater prospects map also they can use is used for uh, uh, planning and uh, geomorphology also they uh, they used and the terrain one and the lineament uh, lineament map also they use and uh, finally they have the ngnrg work map they have an ngnrg portal also with the bhuvan one which is completely linked and uh, whatever the work so far carried has been mapped here actually so they don't repeat the work here so the point is like they they don't need to repeat the work again and again actually so uh, you can go and see this any i mean it's completely open source in generally you can go and see your gram panchayat what other work has been mapped what other work has been completed and uh, you can just do monitoring also and based on that the, i mean you the, you can just uh, i mean uh, instruct your engineers or uh, your planners don't repeat the same work actually because you know, if somebody has been already done the dissertation work you don't need to dissertation again and again actually. so uh, that's how this engineer report is also working so all this uh, kinetic maps everything has been uh, taken into google earth pro actually. so in google earth pro we do the rubber sheeting one all this map has been jura friends and uh, by doing some transparency things we just overlay the climatic maps like one uh, land use with uh, uh, land use with the wasteland land use with uh, uh, geology geomorphology other things so based on that uh, based on that we get the plan <laughs> Participants kindly mute your mic. Please don't interrupt during the presentation. Okay. Please cooperate. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is the final uh, map. What you are seeing for the particular village, the once the planning has been done based on all the thematic layers, uh, what you are seeing is a proposal, a proposed activity map. So you can see the what are the uh, I mean streamlines and uh, culvert, what are the plans, the bunch strengthening activities and the. Uh, I mean, the mini forests, so paid farm ponds and uh, dug pond activities. All these things has been planned. So for all these things, you cannot you cannot simply plan this uh, farm pond. Say, hey, go and do uh, like a farm pond or, or, or something like that. Actually, so if you want to have a farm pond, your soil has to be uh, soil your soil characteristics has to hold the uh, water. And your lineament has to be support on that. So these are the parameters has to be taken care. So simply, just like that, you can't go and plant something in the field and uh, carry out the work. So, so that's it. Uh, this is how the gram panchayat level planning has been happening actually. So as I said earlier, if you guys, if some of you are really interested to involve in the planning of your village, uh, gram panchayat, and you can get connected to us, and I can put you with the. Uh, respect to uh, agriculture I and mean, respect to rural department engineers you can part of that planning and uh, it will be useful for the for your village as well as uh, for the plan as well so and that's it thank you very much what do you think yes ma'am thank you thank you thank you for a wonderful presentation so uh we had uh, three eminent speakers uh, talking and uh, giving us lots of information. Uh, I think all the faculty members and students uh, had a very good time learning many new things. Uh, sir uh, Kumarasamy sir and uh, Dash sir, are you there? Shall we take some questions, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, uh, we'll start with the. Uh, 
Kumara Swami sir, uh, like Dr. A. Muttakrishnan wants to know uh, the difference between uh, real time data and uh, reliable remote sensing applications. Uh, and he wants to know about uh, UAV drawn survey mapping. Mm -hmm. Muttakrishnan. Muttakrishnan, yes. Sir. So the first one is about the drone survey? Yes, sir. Real time, real time monitoring through UAV drone survey mapping. How is it reliable? Ah, probably he has done, sir, because he is working in the disaster and he should know about it. The next building is uh, the cloud board where that uh, comrades, both of us, uh, both of us are uh, my students and uh, they know each other. And he is doing for the entire Madras and the drone survey and he is working on disasters. Yes, probably we can meet uh, Dr. Kamaraj in the next building and inquire about it. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, next sir. question by Ajay Kumar. How GIS is used for transportation? Transportation, uh, one is uh, earlier, uh, navigation, then road network, and then air navigation, all these things uh, from starting to end and the toll collection for all. So even our uh, traffic. So we are doing this uh, in this transportation analysis, and uh, as we said earlier, the sky is the limit, unlimited possibilities. Okay, sir. Now uh, Shivateja uh, is asking uh, mm -hmm. land use, land cover mapping. Uh, mm -hmm. For that, which satellite data is best for district-wise land use, land cover it's mapping? Like, uh, because uh, now the districts are coming down; they are shrinking. And so the earlier it was 80 meter, then 30 meter, then 10 meter, 1 meter, half a meter, and so on. So it all depends upon the work they want to carry out and the price they want. Uh, Kuldeep Sharma wants to know uh, about the role of geoinformatic system in the control of crime. Crime mapping. Because a number of studies have been carried out. Even last week we had a crime mapping for. Trichrapalli, the PhD work, and uh, that was about uh, really limited crimes, not always. Another uh, dimension is uh, you have to incorporate your secondary data in this platform. That's a crucial thing because getting the red tie is like a help. Getting data is a, another dimension. I think uh, that question is answered. Uh, now, okay. Mukta Krishnan again wants to know about uh, the integration of uh, WhatsApp live location or current location, shared data. Uh, like when you talk about real time data, he yes. wants to know how uh, WhatsApp location, uh, current location, how it is being done. Uh, is it real time application of geoinformatics? Geoinformatics is a uh, hundred handed uh, animal. So which animal, which hand he wants to know? The WhatsApp uh, sharing he is asking, sir. Live location, current location, sharing data. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. If we have a geostation, yeah, probably that one Agraj comes yeah. in. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jyoti, I want, to, I want to answer for this. Ah, yes, you so can. So you, uh, we all know that uh, we are seeing that Google uh, uh, traffic data. You know how the traffic data is coming actually it is based on your uh, uh, i mean your gps data from your mobile actually uh, if you on the gps on your mobile you can see the uh, uh, you can see the i mean volume of uh, traffic say for example if you stand in tidal park and if you have a thousand mobiles which is uh, your i mean your location is on and your map will show red color actually if you switch off all the mobiles it will show green so that is how the real time data is used by others actually unknowingly from our side. Uh, we are also helping to some extent it is a benefit for us to, uh, to some extent it's also not good for others. Also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, telling the truth, but uh, he cannot. Yeah. <laughs> Research is different from practice. Yeah. Right. Sir. <laughs> I think that uh, question is answered. Amutu Krishnan will be satisfied, I think. Uh, then uh, I'll move on to, uh, I think, uh, Dash sir. Uh, he wants to know, uh, Dr. Sridhar wants to know what satellite data is used in coastal management 
uh, is there any thermal data used for bathymetric studies and uh, one more question he has a role of nccr in coastal zone regulation dash yeah. sir you can take i just i just said you know coastal coast is belongs to two ministry in the country one is uh, my one is uh, ministry of environment forest and climate change and ministry of earth sciences as per the coastal mission document in the country uh, they do the management aspect they took the entire regulatory zone information everything if you want to get but uh, crz is not coming as a it is a line right it is a area demarcation area that don't come you know as it is if you have to do lot of research on that you have to go do find out actually what are the things is available in in, in the particular in the in the area yeah. so that's why the science part we do so science part means we all the inputs goes from the ministry and as well as a lot of uh, universities also involved into this and there is a big uh, project was going on and that project will be taken care by the finally crz demarcation if you want somebody want to know as a user i want to get crz of my area then he has to approach the ministry of environment and uh, uh, climate change environment and climate change uh, in chennai there is ncsm is there they are there they will uh, sole organization to to give you the things even for clearance and everything but uh, uh, for nccr side we do all this activity uh, because uh, it is a input to the ministry and as well as for our scientific understanding purpose which is uh, required so that's why we do all the uh, measurements as i told you five mem approach you know measurement monitoring and um, modeling so these three things we take it very seriously and we do all these three things okay so one more question uh, which software is best used for hydrological modeling of rivers ha huh. no i think uh, yeah hydrological i'll tell you that uh, geo actually there are so many software is available uh, regarding uh, open source is there and as well as actually we work on mic mic modeling but uh, if you want to do hydrology particularly you can do the hecras uh, so hecras modeling is a, it is open source modeling so you can uh, get it from the internet also number 2 and uh, somebody was asking me that you know uh, what type of uh, satellite data is required for coastal zone management no my yes. previous yes. so coastal zone so uh, as i told you, you know when it depend upon what type of studies you want to do suppose if you want to monitor the entire uh, pollution aspect or uh, entire blooming aspect you need a very coarse resolution satellite data uh, whereas if you want to do actually do cadastral level information like tsunami it is happening how much area is going to be inundated if mangrove is happening mangrove is there then how the change detection studies is doing on if you want to do you need high resolution if you want to do flood or you want to do particularly things like that then you need even submitter dtm type of information you need to do you need to get it so uh, the domain is very huge domain uh but the general point of view till i will tell you that uh, mostly a moderate resolution data sets is highly useful for the uh, coastal uh, problem to address the coastal problems uh, another question uh, posted by dr sridhar uh, okay. like chennai flood done 2015 was it man made or natural uh, and what are your <laughs> modeling studies uh, have you cannot you say you cannot uh, say that it is man made or uh, you know nature uh, when the disaster comes i always say it never tell that you know you it will come and i will i will come and destroy this much area however uh, we human being thought you know we will try to rescue as much as lives uh, you know we can with our understanding scientific understanding we will try to uh, save as much as life and property and infrastructure so that's why that is the basic under basic motto of our research and everything but uh, uh, when only one thing i will tell you sridhar ji that you know if a carrying capacity of any uh, state or any province or any district or any city if it exceeds okay then flood comes correct so your carrying capacity means what it is not like a drain or you know if a storm water drain is not clean then also flood will come 
if uh, if so so that's why there are a lot of uh, factors depending on that it is you cannot say it is a man made or you know natural it is it associated both natural and as well as man made because suppose storm water drain is not clear before monsoon then definitely tomorrow it will be a big problem so so all these things should go hand in hand then only a good uh, uh, then only flood can be avoided otherwise uh, uh, flood is happening every day every year and lot of lives is property has been lost okay uh, another question uh, coastal zone regulation maps uh, are available for the entire country and what is the scale a resolution uh, scale and resolution for this maps if it is available uh again i am telling you know this is the uh, this is actually the domain of uh, uh, minister of environment and forest uh, it is actually depend upon the what type of scale you want suppose uh, as i told you know different uh, suppose you want small power plant somebody want to establish then they need one is to five thousand or one is to two thousand scale map suppose if you want to get it then you will get it so yeah. all this uh, in a larger scale if you want to do any infrastructure projects or any port and harbors type of things if you want to study so all this clearance purpose crz clearance and all these things come into picture so i think during that time your scale will be higher so that's why uh, you it is uh, it is not a constant scale it is depend upon you know what type of studies you want to do i think all this information where you will get it is uh, as i told you uh, minister of environment and forest and particularly ncscm in chennai okay thank you sir then uh, what is the role of uh, sand dune in coastal regulation yeah. sand dune yeah it is it is one of the biggest important thing sand dune modeling or that uh, uh sand dune crz is one of the most important part which we are also concerned uh, mm -hmm. uh, because there are so much uh, because of the uh, frequency of uh, this uh, natural disaster like tropical cyclones and comes it uh, the, the sand dune actually changes the, the geomorphology of the sand dune changes actually so that's why we need to understand uh, east coast is the lot of sand dunes are there but you know the ecosystem changes particularly in the we we have done actually one study in puri in odisha because where the total nesting grounds are coming because of this uh, sand dunes are available salvage but uh, over the time we saw that you know it is degrading the sand dunes are not there what 10 years back was that are now sand dunes and but sand dunes the importance of sand dune is very much important we have to do similar type of projects in future also okay uh, now share your challenge and experience on oil spill hazard which has happened in the recent past in chennai yeah uh, actually we are the uh, nccr is the nodal agency which we have done the oil spill modeling and uh, we have uh, that information now it is available real time to the inquiries where you will get all this uh, real, uh, trajectory modeling That's actually it is a called trajectory modeling when the oil spill event happen which area it is going to be affected based on the tidal condition based on the uh, current condition and wind speed condition you will model something so that uh, work actually has been started here but uh, in the recently 2000 uh, i think in 19 no 19 or 18 i think uh, uh, chennai oil spill whatever recently happened uh, during that time we also have a trajectory modeling and as well as apart from that we also studied the how it is affecting to the biota that means how it is affecting to the environment pollution point of view we did extensive extensive study has been done i think you will get one report in there in our website uh, you can see in chennai report you will find particularly that oil spill report you will you will find you will find in our website you can download that and we have also uh, allo, uh, we have real time we have um, uh, even alert to the lot of nearby villages uh, where actually this oil going to come and settle and destroy so that type of things has been done well in advance so this is also still we are doing now we are little bit focus on plastic uh, marine plastic and as well as we are also more focus on the pollution side so this uh, uh, one our pollution group is doing actually all this type of work but it is a good thing that you know we are still continuing 
sir uh, dr sridhar has again asked on uh, uh, about uh, sea erosion and its effect and any study about olive ridley turtle yes uh, olive ridley turtle we have done lot of work uh, particularly gahil mantha coast uh, and uh, gopalpur coast we have uh, taken into two, two sites and uh, how actually net, how this uh, turtle nesting grounds because it is one of the ecological sites so that type of uh, things over the years we are actually doing i think uh, all this reports is available in in our uh, website you can see that but we have done extensively i know very well south india we have not done but in you know, north india we have because they are the most population turtle, turtle nesting ground there we have done two sites one is gaidmatha and another is gopal and uh, one more doubt for muttu krishnan uh, is there any study being conducted for 21 french islands in gulf of mannar uh, gulf of mannar we have taken very big way uh, we have started our one branch office in rameswaram and uh, one of our uh, senior scientist he is uh, doing uh, real time monitoring of the coral of entire 21 islands okay so that work is going on it is uh, having a lot of uh, effect i think everybody knows i think uh, there are a mm -hmm. lot of uh, groups are also working in this so we are doing based on the climate change aspect also and as well as spectral signature of coral also that's why also we are uh, working so i think uh, uh, we are we are we have taken that 21 islands into the consideration Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, all the questions to uh, Dash sir has been answered. Uh, now we'll move on to Nagraj. Uh, Sridhar sir has a question for you. What software be is being used in your studies and GIS? And can mangrove stop sea coast erosion? Can mangrove? Can you repeat stop, the last one? Uh, can mangrove stop sea coast erosion? Oh, okay. Coastal erosion. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, sir, we, uh, we use ArcGIS and Edda's uh, uh, so GIS and remote sensing software for uh, mapping. And uh, yes, your second question, like uh, obviously, yes, it stops erosion actually. Uh, that's that's why it's called BioShield actually. So BioShield is like uh, it stops uh, erosion as well as, um, I mean, the, as you see the mango uh, that. Uh, uh, the species itself with a different uh, root structure actually. So it completely binds uh, sediments and uh, yes, uh, it stops uh, also. Okay. Uh, now, 2016-17 uh, drought situation, is there any change in uh, cropping pattern or uh, the system to the context of, I mean, in uh, Tamil Nadu? Any cropping pattern change in Tamil Nadu? has been advised no i don't think so over the period of year there would be any crop pattern change actually so every year we have a drought and we will say it's a drought that's it next year we will wait for the rain or uh, cover water to have a paddy cultivation other thing uh, i mean the crop pattern change has to be done at least uh, over the period of five years or ten years actually. you can't have a crop pattern change for the for the sake of a year actually. okay uh, Dr. Ram Babu wants to know which data is more accurate for NDVI studies. Oh, see, NDVI study like uh, see, it is like a IR and red band actually. So whatever the resolution you required based on the applications, you can use it actually. So it starts from a Sentinel. Right now, everybody is using Sentinel because you know Sentinel we are getting every 15 days we are getting an image. It's also open source image. So most of the studies you are seeing now people are using Sentinel. So if you want to have any high resolution work like uh, like uh, my uh, Dr. Das and Professor said, so you can even go for a quick but also well be also the different other application you can use it. But overall general Sentinel is sufficient for uh, works now. Okay. Now, Dr. Sridhar wants to know, is Bhuvan giving shape files? No, Bhuvan is not giving shape. Uh, uh, there is a WMS server actually from WMS server. You can connect to our RJS and you can you can digitize it. And there is one site which is called GSI. There's something called Buktash, Buktash something. So they are giving option to download the shape file actually. So all the I think recently they started giving that one. So from that side, you can download the shape files. Geomorphology land use also can do that. 
Okay. Uh, another question is uh, the difference between mangrove species while visualizing the image. How do you differentiate between the mangrove species while visualizing the image? Yeah. Uh, see, mangrove species always will have a bright color in the coast. Actually. Okay. It is like, uh, oh, see, everything you can't uh, do only uh, from the visual actually. You should have the big, I mean, uh, ground knowledge also. That's what we used to call ground toothing. So whatever the image person we do, we have to do ground toothing also. So mostly the, I mean, the student region, the mangrove patches will be there. And uh, the bright one, obviously the mangroves. That's it. And what is DN and remote sensing? My uh, question oh, asked by Mahendra Kumar. That's a very basic question, actually. That's a dish number. So I think I have to give a big lecture for that, actually. So you can Google what is DN, you can get it. Actually. And which is the technique uh, of remote sensing used in structural mapping? Or can, I, can I repeat it? Uh, which technique of remote sensing is used in structural mapping? So what is structural is what is that structural is it's like geological structure what is structure what is what is the structure is meaning that i think uh, mahendra kumar is there uh, if you want to ask the question in person you can unmute and ask what structure is meaning actually we are not sure about mahendra kumar is there Mr. Sir, Sridhar, sir, yes. if you have some something to add, you can add, sir. Yeah, because I am Dr. Sridhar, retired yes, hydrogeologist from Waterboard. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, sir. this structural mapping is nothing but like in geology when you say it is related okay. to fold, fault, ligaments, joints, fractures, all those things can be mapped from the satellite data. Mm -mm. That is, we call it as structural mapping. If okay. you take a rock, we, we should okay. identify the rock whether it is foliated or not. So if it is foliated, we call it as an Isaac rock. Or if it is granite, we say it's a simple granite, igneous rock. Okay. So structural massing, basically they do like this. For structures like faults, folds, joints, fractures, ligaments, etc. Okay, I think this should have satisfy Mr. Uh, Mohan Kumar or Mahendra Kumar. Yes, Mahendra. thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, you want to add on something? Uh, yeah. You can. Okay. Uh, all the presenters who have done their good job. Okay. Because Professor Kumar Sami was my colleague in Teradum, IIRS. And uh, he, there was one question to Kumar Sami about the transportation. Yes. Okay. See, you know how Wala and Uber are operating on this? They are just using this. GIS and GPS with the Google Earth. It's a simple answer. Okay. And second one, which I want to ask uh, Dr. Das is about the coastal zone sand dunes. Because a lot of areas where we found out is the sand dunes are busy being a big problem for us, especially if you take these uh, ferry sands near Trinil Valley, Tutukudi districts. They are causing a lot of problems with respect to coastal zone erosions. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, third is one. that is true. That is true. Yeah. And the third one, which I addressed to Mr. Nagaraj, is about the Bhuvan. Bhuvan doesn't give shape files. And yes. most of them, they are not giving shape files. I don't know. Because students should understand about the shape files so that they can use it for their application purposes. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for joining. Anybody else want to add on to this? Uh, I don't know who all are there. Uh, one more question from Dr. A. Muthakrishnan. Weekly blockwise NDVI data, uh, is it available in ncfc.gov.in? Is, is it a question or uh, he is giving some input? I'm not sure. He is giving, he is giving suggestions. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then how Kalman filter model helps to predict the future shoreline trends? Nagulan has asked. Mm, yeah, it will be useful. Future it shoreline be, trends. Uh, yeah, shoreline change for Kalman filter uh, can be used. Uh, that is one way of estimating. Uh, but there are a lot of techniques uh, like DSAS is there that you can do it. But it is one type of filtering technique. Uh, you In image processing, we do this. 
Kanban filter is mostly we are also using sometimes. Okay, I think uh, that's all. Uh... Uh, one more question from Muthu Krishnan. Uh, recent our country is meeting another situation, grasshopper locust. Any preventive measure taken by MSSRF? In our working area, we don't face this uh, locust issue actually. But Professor M.S. Swaminathan has given some guidelines to how to handle this uh, uh, locust issue actually. So he has suggested to use uh, neem oil spraying for the I mean, crops. So you can just Google it. He also given an extensive uh, interview also on that uh, uh, that aspect. I think uh, it's a long time uh, making all of you senior professors sitting like this. So mm -hmm. we will wind up uh, the session. Uh, I think no more questions. Anybody wants to ask any questions? I think that's it. <laughs> Current crisis that cost is facing right now. One more question, sir. I think Dash, sir, can answer that. What is yeah. the current crisis that? Current crisis is, if I say, you know, the emerging crisis is now people are talking about plastic, marine plastics. So that is one of the new trend, new core of research. People has to be a little bit serious about that because we, that is a main made. We pollute the environment. So that aspect, we have no information how you can estimate uh, marine plastic in a liter, one liter water. There is no mechanism is there. So that type of research has to come up, which uh, ministry has taken very seriously recently. And we are asking uh, people, we do a lot of uh, uh, motivational uh, cleaning activities throughout the country and as well as scientific research also we do now so that's why uh, these are the new trends actually people are doing on because the traditionally pollution is a general trend but uh, microplastics uh, in the water makes uh, a new research in this area thank you sir that uh, i hope nagulan is satisfied uh, now, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers all the uh, for the eminent lecture. Uh, you have taken so much of pain and uh, um, for, uh, I mean, yes, uh, that sir was uh, yesterday struggling a lot. Um, now I'll just try. No, but sir, we uh, managed. Uh, yeah, yeah. It is a new platform for everybody, but still yeah, we yeah, managed. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, lots of information, lots of knowledge uh, sharing has happened here. Um, I would like to thank on my behalf and uh, from management, I would like to thank all of you. And we will move on to the uh, official vote of thanks now. Uh, I will call upon uh, Ms. Franchina, Mrs. Franchina Mary, Assistant Professor, Department of Geography for the official vote of thanks. Franchina. Yes, yes. Am yes. Good evening to all and all. On behalf of the Department of Geography, Nirmala College for Women, I take this opportunity to propose the word of thanks for the webinar lecture series on real-time development applications of remote sensing and DAS. At this outlet, I would like to thank our principal for her constant support in all our endeavors. I wish to express a heartfelt gratitude to all our distinguished speakers of the day, Professor Dr. Kumaraswamy, Dr. Sisa Kumar Das and Mr. Naharajan for grazing your important work and sharing your thoughts and opinion with us today. Thank you for enlightening us with your knowledge and experience. We have been very much fortunate to have eminent persons from academia and industry for our today's webinar who is in various capacities are making exemplary contribution in the field of remote sensing and GAS. Today's lecture has thrown some light on finding out various applications of geoinformatics and its different components of geoinformatics, geoinformatics for coastal applications and various warning systems using GAs and remote sensing technology in the current scenario and near future. And also the knowledge shared by our resource person from the from the year, year one, year long experience 
in various domains would surely be a great helpful to the future researcher in, the, in their framing work. I would also like to express my sincere thanks to the entire participants for their patient listening and make our section more lively through your interactions. Thank you once again. Thank you, Franchina. So I think we will wind up. Thanks to all the participants. Thanks to all speakers for uh, helping us uh, in this lockdown period. Uh, hope uh, all of you are staying at home safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, sir.